Good morning, everyone. My name is Anne Marie McGrory. I'm the communications manager with the Stonely Foundation, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's event. Uh, as a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of today's discussion. You may submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please include your name and organization so we can identify you. With that, I'd like to turn it over to today's moderator, Kathleen Creamer, to begin today's discussion. Thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, everyone. So on behalf of the Stoney Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I couldn't be more excited to be part of this conversation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kathleen Creamer. I'm the managing attorney of the Family Advocacy Unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. And I'm also a former Stoney Foundation fellow, and I'll be moderating this morning's discussion. Before I turn over to our panelists, I wanna provide some background for today's events. Over the past few years, against the backdrop of the COVID pandemic and within the context of a national racial justice reckoning, policymakers and the public have begun an earnest debate about whether our public systems are really serving youth, families, and communities. At its heart, this debate is about scrutinizing the assumptions, the structures, and the practices that have resulted in disproportionate and often harmful racist interventions into the lives of Black and Brown families and communities. We are listening to impacted communities in new ways, and they're telling us about the harms even our most well-intentioned interventions have had in their lives. And what was considered impractical or even radical has now become mainstream and a growing narrative that large public systems are too slow to reform and are plagued by antiquated approaches to societal challenges. There's a growing dialogue asking us to consider whether these systems have harmed more than they have helped and also a rich body of abolitionist thinking that's pushing us all to reimagine what authentic safety and support looks like in communities. As leaders, we are also being asked to re-examine our own roles as gatekeepers, decision makers, and spokespeople. At its core, we're being asked by impacted communities to question and upend how we are using our power and our resources. We are also being asked not only to radically rethink how we deploy our resources, but we're also being asked to take seriously calls for us to repair the damage that we have caused with our carceral approaches and take accountability for the ways that these approaches have destabilized and harmed families. This is a time that demands our humility, our curiosity, and our commitment to learning and doing much, much better. Which brings us to today's discussion. I'm joined by an outstanding panel of visionary leaders who will discuss the ways which the, in which the public safety, youth justice, child welfare and immigration systems are and are not serving families and communities and why we must do better. We'll interrogate the ways that each of these systems separate and dismantle families and we'll re-envision what it would look like to truly support families. This is an extraordinary moment in history, and I'm thrilled to be joined by some extraordinary advocates and thinkers. I do want to say we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you all in the audience as well. So we're going to leave plenty of time for question and answer at the time of our at the end of our discussion. So please submit your questions throughout the event using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So with that introduction, I want to just dig right in. So let me introduce our panelists to you. I have today with me Jonah Eaton, the Director of Legal Services and Nationality Service Center and a supervising attorney for the Pennsylvania Immigrant Family Unity Project. I have Kendra Vanderwater, the Executive Director of the Youth Empowerment for Advancement Hangout, also known as Yeah Philly, a Black-led community-based nonprofit that works with teens and young adults ages 15 to 24 who have been impacted by violence. And I have Shireen White, the Director of Advocacy and Policy at Children's Rights, which investigates, exposes, and combats violations of children's rights across the country. Shireen is also the author of a landmark report issued earlier this year on structural racism at the front end of child welfare systems. So I'm ready to just dig right in. And I, I think what might be helpful to frame this conversation is to invite each of you to tell us how this reimagination of public systems is happening in your area of focus. So Kendra, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, so thanks for having us. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And so 
for me, my day-to-day work, first of all, I've worked in system. I was looking for that I was working towards really cannot happen um, within systems. So the day-to-day work is, you know, working with young people who have been in the juvenile legal system, who have been and continue to be in DHS or, you know, um, the KUA family. So every day is really us fighting systems, unfortunately. It's us supporting young people in holistic ways that oftentimes systems do not recognize. So we're in court every day, you know, and when young people may be on probation or under DHS custody, oftentimes they come with a perspective of non-compliance, of this person didn't do this right, or this person is late to school seven times. For us, yes, we understand, you know, people may be late to school, they may have all of these things going on, they may be quote unquote non-compliant with a system, but we look at the person as a whole person, and we look at all all of the other things that go with these things around non-compliance. So we look at how is how does their home environment look, right? Like how how are they acting in school? What are what environment are they living in? Who is their most supportive network? What does this person need to just be able to survive in life? And so oftentimes we are fighting systems and trying to show the courts that it is not just a person doesn't go to school. It's all of these other things around the social determinants of health that prevents this person from being able to focus on going to school or focus on being able to thrive as being a young person. So much there that I wanna circle back to. I am totally hearing you on that. Um, Shireen, do you, do you wanna take us away? Yeah, sure. Um, Kathleen, thanks for that introduction. Um, I love your energy and I'm, I'm also excited Um, to be here, especially as somebody who spent most of my adult life in Philadelphia, um, and I actually still reside in Pennsylvania, not far away. Um, So in the child welfare space, I am super excited uh, about the work that impacted people are doing to reimagine what it means to be safe for them and what it means to help their communities thrive. And so um, following that work every day um, is teaching all of us um, as child welfare, child welfare professionals about what needs to be done and the changes that need to be made, the transition that needs to happen. And I'll say at Children's Rights, we spend um, a good amount of our work focused on children who are already in the custody of the child welfare agency. And as we've set and done our own reflections, we realize that we've spent far too much time in the past focused on permanency, focused on um, you know, children who are in custody and not enough time was being spent on identifying, advancing family integrity or understanding what was causing so many children, um, overwhelmingly black and brown children to enter the system in the first place. So as we reimagine our own work, we're excited about identifying strategies that will lift up families and lift up family integrity and stop what's happening at that very front door. And so I'm excited to you know, build out our advocacy and policy work um, and to work with impacted young people and impact, impacted parents so that we can advance rights um, using both advocacy tools and um, legal tools uh, to do this work. So it's an exciting time for sure in child welfare. And I know I already shouted out your report, but I want to shout it out again because folks are really starting to grapple with racial injustice in the child welfare system. And I, you couldn't have made a better statement about the realities of the system from the perspective of the folks that I'm working with every day, which is parents impacted by the system. So thank you for that. And I want to urge the audience, if you're interested in child welfare, start there. Um, Thanks so much, Kathleen. (laughs) uh, How about you, Jonah? Um, Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, Boy, this is a I don't often get the opportunity to step back from my kind of day to day work and look at these, you know, big, huge systemic things. Um, So I hope I'm not too tongue tied here. Um, You know, the the immigration system um, is just this kind of vast, very weird patchwork that includes, I think, both kind of our Um, highest and most noble kind of aspirations in terms of human rights and human dignity, and at the same time includes some of our ugliest 
um, you know, and most kind of implicitly racist um, approaches to how to handle and treat um, people who are not citizens of this country. Um, so, you know, it includes the language from international human rights treaties that giving people the right to, to claim asylum, um, but then also, um, you know, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement manages a vast detention network throughout the country. Um, they have broad and largely unchecked powers to detain people um, without any due process at all. Um, and then, of course, to, um, you know, deport people um, through, uh, you know, proceedings that uh, a prominent immigration judge once, 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 uh, once called it uh, a death penalty case in a traffic court setting. Um, and in terms of my day-to-day -day work, a setting where, um, you know, in many cases, the majority of people facing deportation don't have a lawyer. Um, so they're in a courtroom with an immigration judge who works for the Department of Justice, who's wearing a robe, and a prosecutor who works for the Department of Homeland Security, and nobody else. Um, and, you know, I think that further has to be sort of, is sort of further crystallized over the events of the last four to five years, um, in that, um, you know, we had a federal government that kind of went farther than any in modern in sort of recent history in um, really ramping up the, the rhetoric um, and the, the ugly politics um, behind, um, you know, uh, non-citizens and immigrants. Um, but that being said, you know, that that nastiness sits on top of sort of a legal superstructure um, that is highly focused on deporting large amounts of people. Um, and so if you look at ICE statistics, which they they, they, they haven't updated for 2020 yet, um, but, you know, four years of Trump, um, uh, you know, only, you know, well, I should say six years of the Obama administration, Obama deported more people than Trump ever did um, over the four years of his uh, administration. Um, so all that being said, I mean, our kind of, you know, I think in the um, sort of broader immigrant rights movement um, in terms of systemic change is that the, you know, we've been in kind of crisis mode for four years. Um, so we're kind of, you know, back on our heels and very much reacting to what was being thrown at us from Washington. Um, we kind of get a sort of a breather now, but, you know, pushing forward kind of systemic change um, is difficult because you're dealing with federal law and you know changing rules in Washington is very difficult right now. So it is more about thinking about you know what we can sort of accomplish on a more local level, um, and that's very much what you know the the Pi Up project has been about. Um, and it's this radical, crazy idea that well, you know, 75% of people at the main detention center in, in Pennsylvania don't have lawyers, so let's give them free lawyers so we can try to change that. Um, so anyway, I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation, though. <laughs> As you can imagine, Jonah, you're playing my tune a little bit. I mean, there is no way for us to have just systems when families do not have a meaningful defense, and you see that in the child welfare system every day, you see it in the juvenile justice system and you see it in the immigration system. So hopefully we'll circle back to that importance of a meaningful defense for families as they encounter these kind of behemoth systems. Um, but I actually wanna go right into abolition. <laughs> um, so like, let's just dig in so that, you know, there has, in the wake of COVID and the harms of COVID and the, in the wake of a racial justice reckoning, there has been kind of a growing understanding that we, we got to do something, right? <laughs> We're starting to hear from impacted communities. They're telling us that we are causing harm to them. And so what you see is really a continuum of responses to that. And on one end, you see kind of incrementalist reforms that are driven by insiders to the system, like the insider strategies. And then on the other end, and we see this kind of rich and growing abolition movement in each of our fields. Um, and so I, I think it's really important to start the conversation about abolition by framing what it actually is. And so Shireen, can you tell us what is abolition? <laughs> I think this is an awesome starting point because people often really misunderstand abolition and they focus only on one part of it, which is the tearing down or the dismantling of the system and the structures, right? 
And it's so much more than that. It's about getting rid of systems and structure, structures and practices and policies that criminalize black and brown people that devalue black and brown parents and, and their families. But on the other side of that, it's also what we just talked about, the reimagining and abolition is that act of building up communities and reimagining what it means to be safe, to thrive in communities and building a better way for us to provide for families, to provide for people um, so that they can live safely in their communities and in their homes. And I think we often forget about this other side, um, but it exists and that's the work that's being done right now. We are hearing so many conversations moving beyond um, the fact that the system is racist or the fact that the system um, is set up to allow white supremacy and oppression of marginalized communities to continue, we're moving beyond that and rethinking what it means to build up um, safe communities and thriving, thriving communities. So I love that this conversation has started at that point of the reimagining, as opposed to taking us back to you know, the history. There's a lot out there on that piece. Um, and I'm loving the conversations that move us forward in this way. Thank you. That's such an important framing. And I, I, it's been a very, as somebody who's like learning and studying so much about abolition, it's been very frustrating to see a lot of completely inaccurate kind of hot takes um, by, by insider professionals about what abolition is. Um, you guys, we live in the same city as Dorothy Roberts, <laughs> the godmother of abolition for child welfare. If you haven't engaged with her work before you write your hot take on abolition, you're doing it wrong. Um, I actually, as a public service to all of us, uh, I work with the ABA, we did a plenary session, I interviewed Dorothy Roberts and we called it demystifying abolition. And I asked her all the questions that people have about abolition that stem from their misunderstanding of what it is. So if you want a one-on-one, a primer on abolition in the child welfare system, you can ask Dorothy Roberts, or you can watch me ask Dorothy Roberts. Just Google demystifying abolition. Dorothy Roberts is the first YouTube video that pops up. Um, so Kendra, tell me about abolition and how you're thinking about it in your context. So abolition for us is really, you know, I think we, we think about it as, yes, we are dismantling the way things are, right? But what are we replacing it with? And for us, um, it's more so, the yeah, Philly is a very small, very new nonprofit, but I think we do a good job of putting people on notice, putting systems on notice to say, hey, if we just invested in people and if we invested in our communities, these things would be better. Our outcomes would be better. Our people would be better. Our families would be better. So abolition for us is getting rid of things as we know them and replacing them with investment and real resources, right? I think about how people hear abolition and just like Shireen said, they're like, oh my gosh, we can't get rid of this. But it's so much more than that. It's what are we replacing it with? The same thing around the defund the police conversation, right? It's yes, police can still be here, but we're taking away some of the authority that they have to do things they shouldn't be doing, like responding to mental health crises. I know we focus a lot on probation. Probation is so upset at us because we advocate for kids in court and we get them off of probation. And because the status quo has always been judges and hearing officers saying, oh, defer to probation, defer to probation. And now we're in court and they're saying, no, we wanna hear from Yef Philly. That's upsetting people. That's upsetting the systems. And to us, that is what abolition is. So if we're not investing in just the bare minimum needs, like at the bare minimum of giving people access to the things that they need, right? Like we need money. We need well-paying jobs, not just jobs. We need access to food. We need our bills paid. We need all of these things. We need mental health support. We need black therapists for black kids. Like we need quality services. And so for us, that's what abolition is. It's not just, oh, we're tearing it down and we're dismantling, but we're tearing it down and we're replacing it with things that our communities and our people deserve. Mm -hmm. Love that. Jonah, tell us what it, what the abolition con, commu, uh, conversation is looking like in the immigration context. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's, 
it means different things to different people. Um, and I think that there's sort of a couple different kind of core issues um, that mostly sort of come up uh, in, in this particular context. I think that the first thing, though, kind of general point I'd, I'd want to make about the immigration system um, is how uh, sort of intrinsically linked it is with the criminal justice system um, and how, you know, many of um, the exact same laws that led to, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s um, that kind of really drove mass incarceration and over policing um, had consequences on the immigration side, too. Um, so it's like it's baked into the same statutes. Um, so while we were, you know, ramping up over policing and obviously over policing in communities of color, we were also adding to the long list of ways in which um, contact with the criminal justice system can get somebody deported. Um, so, you know, one story is, you know, we had a client, uh, one of my clients a couple of years ago, um, you know, he had several shoplifting convictions over a number of years after he had gotten his green card. Um, total value of merchandise, about $200. Um, he also had a, you know, partner and a son here in the United States. He was placed in deportation proceedings for the shoplifting convictions. And we fought that case all the way to the Third Circuit and did emergency district court litigation and we lost and he's deported. And I don't think that guy will ever see his son again. Um, so like, you know, the, those two systems um, and he's, you know, was originally from Angola. Um, he's black. And so that also means, you know, he's the type of person who's more likely to get picked up for shoplifting convictions in the first place. Um, so, you know, these things very much kind of move, move have moved in tandem. Um, and so I think one aspect of the abolition really, I think, you know, sort of perfectly dovetails with, you know, abolitionist conversations about the criminal justice system and ending um, over policing, ending just these like metastasizing, sprawling criminal codes that we have um, that sweep up more and more conduct. Um, also related to that is the extraordinary, as I mentioned in sort of at, at the at the at the front, these are the extraordinary powers that ICE has to detain people, sometimes just open endedly. And there's actually a mandatory detention statute where you don't get a bond hearing. So a judge will never make it any kind of decision about whether or not um, you are um, actually a flight risk or a danger. It's just automatic. Nope, we're just going to hold you for as long as your proceedings go, and that can take years. Um, so the uh, so there's also conversations about just ending immigration detention generally, but at the very least eliminating the mandatory detention statute. And then if you want to go on the real, you know, kind of freak people out, blow people's minds when you're talking about abolition in the immigration context is you're talking about the abolition of borders um, and just, you know, not doing this, you know, I'll go find another line of work and just not doing an immigration law anymore, um, which I think to many years sounds kind of insane. Um, but, you know, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, the United States has been around for, um, you know, over 200 years. Our first immigration law wasn't actually passed until um, 1870. <laughs> um, so for the first 100 years of the Republic, um, we basically had no regulation of who came and went. Um, and I think it's telling that that first law, the Page Act, um, was explicitly racist. It was it was a ban on immoral Chinese women from entering the United States, and that was quickly grew into what's known as the Chinese Exclusion Acts, um, which barred anybody from China from setting foot onto U.S. soil, um, with some very narrow exceptions. Um, so that's the um, you know so that's I think what we're talking about about abolition in the uh, in the immigration context. So uh, Shireen and Kendra, you both called out the, 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 what I think is like kind of the foundational myth that's out there about abolition, that it's just a nihilistic vision that just wants to tear down when in fact, some of the most important work that abolitionists are doing are building and imagining and growing. Um, and so either of you, or actually I would love to hear from both of you, what is the, what what does that reimagining look like? Where are we trying to go with that? You want me to start, Kendra? <laughs> um, in the in the child welfare space, there is um, a lot of work I think to delink help services supports um, from the child welfare system, and that's a huge part of the reimagining. 
so often right now, and in order for people to get the help that they need or services um, on a list for services, even they have to come into contact with the child welfare system. And so there's a lot of work to be done to take some of that money from the child welfare system and instead invest in communities. So you'll often hear, you know, divest in the system and invest in communities. And um, that investment consists of monetary supports to families, housing supports, you know, um, employment assistance, better schools, um, you know, mental health services and supports and accessibility to, to those types of services in the community. And um, so that's a huge part, that delinking part is a huge part of the reimagining um, in the child welfare system. And, and the other piece of it is looking at some of the laws and legislation. I mean, Jonah went back to, you know, the very first um, piece of legislation on the immigration context and how the backdrop was a racist backdrop. And the same thing holds true in the child welfare system and the laws and policies that have shaped it for so long. And um, we, we know that they're rooted in um, racism and also have had such a disproportionate harm to black and brown families. And so um, the reimagining also means tearing down those types of policies and, and laws in the child welfare space as well. How about you, Kendra? Absolutely, absolutely that. And I think I'll speak from the juvenile um, legal system perspective. So I think about how definitely the laws and the policies, right? Like we, we're we working with Rick Krajewski, um, a state rep on introducing a bill around birth certificates. So I think about how in the state of Pennsylvania, if you are not 18, you cannot get your own birth certificate if unless you're like, close family member, parent, someone uses their social security number to get a birth certificate for you. So I think about all the young people we deal with who are disconnected from families. They come from foster care. They're in juvenile detention centers. They come to us and they're 20 years old and they've been attached to these systems since they were 13 and 14 years old and still don't have their vital documents. So for me, that like that's ridiculous and that's unacceptable. So reframing and reimagining is, you know, a start and reform is a start for us. So we think about it as if these systems are still here, we should be requiring to, to get them their vital documents while they are attached to these systems. There should be no ifs, ands, buts about that. Also, I think about Pennsylvania and Philadelphia specifically, we have a high, high intensive supervision rate of just people in general being surveilled and monitored, they still have nothing they need. So the day-to-day -day work around what does that look like? We are literally locking people up all of the time and people are still being killed all throughout the day. So that tells me what we're doing is not working, right? Like our law enforcement initiatives are not working. So how are we gonna change that? And for us, that looks like, how do we add better community support? I think about the gun violence crisis we're in. There's an entire generation of kids literally being killed. They're being killed, all of them. And what are we doing about it besides having police and law enforcement say, you know, we are, we are working with the feds and we are locking as many people up as possible. But from my perspective, it's I know so many kids who are terrified of dying and they are carrying guns. Why are we still locking them up? Because at the end of the day, we live in a play, we live in war zones and we don't talk about that. How are we making our war zones better? Which is where I believe community investment comes in. And so getting rid of these things and replacing it with holistic support, right? Like we know people are gonna make bad decisions. We know people make mistakes and that's just people. That's what happens when you work with people. So I think when we support people in specific ways and, and meet them where they are in real life, you know, that's part of divesting from the system and giving to the community. How are we forming initiatives that actually work? Philly is big, their conversation is big around diversion, right? But the conversation also doesn't go back to we're only diverting like misdemeanor charges. And these things have to happen. I know people may be scared and say, oh, if we divert, you know, violent charges, 
or people who have violent charges against them, that is a threat to public safety. For me, that is just not true, right? Like we have to look at people as a case by case thing and not everyone just because you have a violent charge against them like a carjacking is a violent charge right so diverting a carjacking is very different than diverting an attempted murder obviously but these things are the things that we have to change these laws have been created hundreds and thousands of years ago and they literally target our communities and so when we think about divesting from the systems. For us, it's how do we move past this? Yes, we know these systems are racist. Yes, we know they target black and brown communities, but what are we really doing about it? And how are we elevating people to be better and live better in our society? Love it and love the framing of all of this, right? So it's about kind of divesting from systems that intend to help but are actually doubling down on the harm, right? And then also lifting our worthiness tests for people to get access to what they need to survive and thrive, right? Like lift those worthiness tests. Let's let people find the support that they need in their own community. And part of that is divesting from systems that really operate on a mentality of surveillance, control, and punishment. Um, and, you know, I want to come from the child welfare perspective. I was like listening to a panel of an abolitionist versus an insider and the insider's like, don't call it a family regulation system because it's not, it's a system that's designed to support, help children and help child welfare move forward. The abolitionists have moved away from saying child welfare. They now say family regulation. And what I would invite all of our audience to reflect on whether you agree it's a child welfare system, it's a family regulation system, please reflect on how families experience the system. What would they say to you their experience is of the system? Would they say it's a system that promotes my welfare? Or would they say it's a system that surveils, controls, and punishes me? We have to bring that perspective into our understanding of how these systems operate. Um, so much more to say about that, but I actually want to move on to racism and racial injustice, because that is really the underpinning of a lot of the conversations we're having. And a lot of these systems are owning that they are perpetuating racial injustice. And one of the proposed solutions is strategies to reduce disproportionality. And I'm wondering if our panelists feel that that's a helpful lens um, to address the problems within systems. I'm happy to start on that because when you mentioned our call to action report that we published back in May, and we had a huge discussion in the beginning about what the focus should be, right? Because you, there's a lot of data out there on racial disproportionality and you know, Dorothy Roberts was writing about that decades ago. The discussion was on racial disproportionality and the overrepresentation of black and brown children and families entangled with the child welfare system. And so we decided like we need to move beyond that. And we instead of just focusing on the racial disproportionality data, let's lift up experiences of what black and brown families are experiencing through the system. And even more, let's call out what's really contributing to the overrepresentation of black and brown people in the child welfare system. And that is racism, right? A system that's rooted in racism and white supremacy. And so I think when we limit the discussion to just racial disproportionality, then we actually limit um, the, the goals and what needs to be done to address it, right? Nobody's asking for proportionate representation, right? In the child welfare system, that's not the goal. That's not what we're looking for. And so um, if we extend the true problem and identify it as um, getting rid of a system that allows and perpetuates white supremacy and oppression of marginalized communities, then we can, we can more clearly see the goal of transformation, right? And tearing down and rebuilding and the abolitionist framework um, becomes a real reality to work toward when we imagine like the greater problem of um, racist roots within the system. So, and, I, and I'm happy, I'm seeing so many more conversations moving, moving beyond just the disproportionality. Kendra and I were on a panel um, in Colorado for NAC back in the summer and the entire framework was about 
white supremacy and and how the systems that we um, are subjected to are rooted in that. And I think that's where the conversation needs to go so that we understand the greater goals. Anyone else want to comment on that one? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with that. I think just even being a black woman, right? Like when we talk about these things, people don't listen. People don't, you know, people do not listen to you as a black woman. They 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 act like your experience does not exist. So bringing on more people to move past the conversation of racial disproportionality, right? And I think we were we're also in a time where it's oh we can have implicit bias training. Like we are we are way past this. It's all of these things that people see videos of every day and I think for us it's also exposing these things. Unfortunately, like we should not have to do this but that's how people respond, right? Like exposing the harms that people are, that these systems are doing to people has, has become a way that gains some type of traction beyond a conversation. So when we're thinking about, oh, just racial disproportionality, it's not enough. And what are we doing about it? We need people, you know, getting specific action steps. What can you do in your everyday life around racism and racist structures. And those are the conversations we should be having because people, they don't wanna feel uncomfortable, right? Like these conversations are very uncomfortable, but beyond that, people living in these conditions are uncomfortable every single day. So our discomfort comes from our experiences and that's fine that people are uncomfortable. I, I'm okay with that, but we are in a time now where it is just so past due, we're past the, conversations of basic definitions and it's what is the action steps what are the action steps that we're taking what people are we bringing on board because then you also see a lot of times people are scared there are people who work in places they're scared to lose their job they're scared to speak out against things and while i understand it for me that's that's just not good enough right now and so we need to gather the people who are on board to make a bigger uh, stink about you know what's going on and still leaking these videos still showing people the harms that are being done because I don't know why but people have to see a video before they believe that these things happen unless it happens directly to them um yes let's all show up as learners with humility right like we like there are lots of folks uh, who are operating in these systems who are having very defensive reactions right now uh, i always tell my daughter if you're not uncomfortable you're not learning right if you're very comfortable what are you doing get uncomfortable right and so i, I think that's really important and also like uh I, I we can't limit ourselves to racial disproportionality and thank you for saying that out loud like if we suddenly got to children in the child welfare system and children in the juvenile justice system being uh in in detention in proportion to their population in the general population like that's not justice that's not safety and we can't just define justice and safety in that way um I, I want to start going into some of your kind of organizational specific kind of thoughts and strategies and um, like, I really want to talk for a moment about how we engage the folks that we are serving. Um, and so I'll start with Jonah and Kendra, if one of you want to talk about how do you support the people that you um, are employed to serve and like how do how do we or how do you like center the voices and lived experiences of those folks. Jonah can go. I'm talking a lot. Go ahead. Jonah. <laughs> All right, Jonah, you go. <laughs> I like I like being called on. Um, <laughs> uh, I, was, I, was, I was a real I was a real winner in elementary school. Um, I think that well, I have actually have got some particular perspective on that. I think as a uh, as an attorney, um, because I think that there's um, kind of a really unfortunate sort of. Um, proclivity among sort of a, 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 a the sort of like lawyer brain when it comes to attorneys working in the public interest space certainly not all probably not even a majority um but where um uh you know we kind of talk too loud and um you know uh you know maybe talk over um sort of the representatives of the of the communities that you know we're we're supposed to be um 
uh, supporting. Like I, I view the, my role just as an attorney when I'm like, you know, litigating and advocating for clients. Um, you know, I'm operating within a really screwed up and um, kind of in some ways wicked system. Um, and so like, I'm going to do the best I can for my individual clients. But like, you know, when I'm arguing a case in, in like immigration court, I'm not there as like a structural change agent. Um, I'm there as like, a, you know, I'm like a plumber. <laughs> like I'm, I've got like a, I've got like a useful skill. And if you've got a burst pipe in your basement, you know, a plumber is really important to you at that moment. Um, but I'm not, you know, changing all the lead pipes in Flint or something like that. Maybe that analogy is a little too tortured. Um, so I think that in, you know, in, in PIFUP, we've worked very hard to be, um, you know, very much kind of directed by um, sort of needs and concerns of the community-based organizations who are part of our coalition. Um, so that, you know, we're, 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 we're very much, uh, you know, linked to and listening to and responding to sort of the direct needs of community members. And I think recently we had a really kind of a pretty inspiring um, example of that. Um, so the main detention center in Pennsylvania rather unexpectedly last summer, they ended their contract with ICE. So this, you know, 300 um, non-citizen detainees um, were going to be moved um, because, you know, York County Prison was shutting down. Um, and so, you know, we had sort of a you know, all hands on deck kind of effort with, um, you know, like Juntos here in Philadelphia, um, with uh, MILPA, Make the Roads, sort or of more state level organizations, um, and just working hand in hand with the community orgs. You know, they were talking to their members, figuring out who had family members who were in York, um, and doing really aggressive advocacy. You know, don't transfer these people to some detention center in Florida or Louisiana, just let them go. Because <laughs> um, again, this is civil, non criminal detention, right? They're, they're, these people are not being punished for, for any offenses or anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, out of 300 people, we got 100 released, um, which, uh, you know, I think was, was is, is a pretty good batting average in our business. Um, and so that's sort of a model, I think, of how um, we can work, um, you know, really closely with, uh, with the CBOs and sort of take leadership. Um, just as sort of a footnote to the York closure, though, I mean, you know, one step forward, two steps back. And also, actually, let me add too that this is this this is a relationship that has been more fraught in other places, in like New Jersey and New York, um, because there is this you know hard thing. Like if a if a detention center gets closed down in New Jersey or Pennsylvania, and those folks get relocated to largely the rural South, um, they're not going to have the same access to free counsel that you know because you know these programs have been set up in places like New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, California. Um, and so, you know, there's, there is an immediate difficulty for that group of, of people that can be really serious. Um, but that also then sometimes leads to, again, this kind of lawyer brain thing, you know, some of the attorneys saying, well, we shouldn't shut down these facilities at all. Um, and I don't think that's right. I think that there's strong statistics that show when ICE doesn't have a local detention facility when, where they can warehouse people, um, they're less likely to detain people at all. Um, so we still need, you know, our, you know the, the big goal needs to be shutting these uh, facilities down. Um, but York is now closed, but they're now finalizing a contract to open an 1800 bed private geo group facility at Moshannon Valley. So, um, won a battle, but losing the war on that one, I think. Jonah, it pains me a little bit to hear you describe yourself as a plumber because you just described a hundred <laughs> families that are together because of you. And like, I really want to call out very explicitly, like abolitionists would say providing a meaningful defense for families up against this, these systems is the work of abolition and you won't ever have a just system without it. So please don't, don't diminish <laughs> your efforts. They're so important. Um, Speaking of um, systems and carceral systems, I want to turn to Shireen for a moment because I think folks kind of instinctively understand the juvenile justice system as a carceral system. Like we're putting kids in jails, right? Uh, we're, we're surveilling and monitoring them when they're in the community. And similarly, we're putting whole families in jail in the immigration system, right? Um, wh why or is the child welfare system a carceral system? Yeah, that's that's such a good question because we don't hear that framing enough about the child welfare system, and it absolutely absolutely is a carceral system. When we're talking about a carceral system, we're talking about um, a system where all aspects of life in which people 
are subject to surveillance and they're subject to um, the threat of punitive policies under the premise of safety. And that's the very way in which the child welfare and the child protection systems function, right? It's about policing families um, with mandated reporting. And in some states, universal mandated reporting where everybody's required to call in everything that you see, ejecting them to children, right? That's punishment, that's criminalization. And um, the primary concern with carceral systems is to manage and control rather than to help and invest in communities. And this is so relevant. And, and just recently um, there was a post, I think it was just yesterday, and somebody posted a quote from Dorothy Roberts, who thank you for mentioning, I don't think I can ever do a panel without mentioning her over and over again. Um, but I've learned, I've learned so much from her work that she's put out there for all of us. Um, so somebody posted a quote that's relevant to this very question. Um, and it's from Dorothy Roberts. And she said, prisons and foster care function together to discipline and control poor and low income black women by keeping them under intense state supervision and blaming them for the hardships their families face as a result of societal inequities. That's what the carceral system does, right? It blames people for um, what's happening to them, but as a result of all the inequities in our society that have contributed to their very positions um, and the state and everything that they're that they're going through. So um, child welfare and child protection very much fit um, as a carceral system and have so many things in common with the criminal legal system. And I, I think you can actually, I mean, I know we have um, closed child welfare courts in Philadelphia and through most of the state and I wish that, that weren't so because I think folks really misunderstand how the child welfare system operates. Um, but Shireen and I both have spent many, many an hour in these yeah. systems. And I, I think like on a very basic level, you could see it if you went and sat in the back of any hearing because often the only question that gets asked about a parent in a child welfare system, compliance is yeah. the sole focus yeah. of the proceedings. We actually rate parents one to five. Those yeah. hearings, when we talk about parents, is their obedience to us and our system. Yeah. It's not ambiguous, folks. Like if you came and sat in the back of a courtroom, you would see it in action mm -hmm. every day. And I know Shereen did for quite some time. I just time. want to say too, um, um, that's why I think it's so important for the people doing work to like lift up what's happening in courtrooms. And I'll just put a small plug because I just read a recent article from uh, Steve Volk, who's a reporter in Philly, and he's really focused on um, providing narrative about people's experiences directly in dependency court. And so if you want to learn more about those experiences, even if you can't sit in the back of the courtroom, um, read his work because he's talked to so many families in Philadelphia about their experiences in the courtroom. Um, so I, I want to take a, a, 10 minutes before we move to our audience, because I do, I do know we have a lot of really um, thoughtful folks in the audience, and I definitely want to hear from them and bring them into the conversation. But I do want to talk about like, where do we go now? Like, what's next? And one question I have that I'll just throw to the panel, as we say we need to radically transform or even abolish these systems, who should lead that work? I can go. Definitely people in the community, people who are personally impacted by the things we are talking about, right? And I think where we go from here is for us, advocacy is really, really important. So being a strong advocate, I think there is not enough, you know, trainings to show people how to be an effective and strong advocate and how oftentimes it can be very disheartening or or scary, or, you know, people, people tell us all the time, oh, you're causing too many issues, right? Like you're, you're calling out people that we're, we're friends with and you can't do that. But these are the things and the advocacy that is working. And so scaling that to a larger level, that's definitely what we're looking at doing, you know, partnering with people in a long, long time. So definitely if you elevate that person who has been impacted, believe people, right? Like, how a big part of engagement and how we're so successful at engaging with people and their families and our communities is because we believe them when they tell us something. We do not say, oh, you know, you have to prove this and that. No, we believe you and we are going to advocate with you and we are going to help you get what you need. So I think that's where people can start. You see things, 
start looking into it, you know, standing up for people. You can't be silent about the things that are going on around you. Anyone else have thoughts about that? Who leads this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's simple. Impacted families, impacted people lead this work. And, um, you know, they know the system in a way that some of us never will. And they understand what their family's needs are, um, what their children's needs are. Um, and we got to take a step back and let them tell us and guide us, you know? So we're listening um, as child welfare professionals in the field. Yeah, I agree. I, I um, agree with that. Um, I do think that it, it's, it's, there's sort of an extra degree of complication maybe in the immigration space and that you're talking about a population that uh, by definition, for the most part, can't vote, <laughs> can't run for office. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, they are, they are very formally uh, um, excluded from sort of participating in the political process. And of course, you know, when we're saying immigrant, you know, there is, you know, mo most households are mixed households. You have some U.S. citizens, you have some non-citizens. Um, but, um, you know, I do think that that means that there is, um, you, know, uh, you know, a role for, you know, people who have that citizenship and who can speak without, um, you know, kind of fear of, of, of retribution um, in terms of trying to make progress in this space. Um, although I think a really kind of awesome example of very much a community-led um, effort is, you um, uh, is is the dreamers and you know kids who are or are not even kids anymore <laughs> there are plenty of people with daca who are you know starting have started families um because the program has been around long enough um but trying to advocate for a path to citizenship um for people who were sort of granted this amorphous temporary relief under the uh, obama administration um I mean, it's very depressing that that hasn't, you know, that should be really just like obvious low hanging fruit. Let's just get this done. And it still hasn't happened. But, um, um, but that's, I think, very much, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, impacted population led, um, led movement. So before we move to questions, I, I, I want um, to, to address the audience, because in our audience today, we have some very important gatekeepers and power holders, right? We have people who are leading systems. We have people who are funding systems. Um, and I, I wanna ask, how can our audience respond to this momentum? How can our audience respond? And I'll open it up to anyone who, who has thoughts on that. So I definitely think it's a power shift. Um, a lot of the things we talk about are about power. So if we're not shifting that power and people have the power and the authority to make some of these things happen, and Jonah just spoke about low hanging fruit, like there are a lot of things that we could easily do as a system that we just don't do, which is why we go back to just the racial structures and the people we put in power, right? So having that power and making power shifts is really important. And those are some things that the audience can do. And really listening to the people that you serve. Like uh, oftentimes the institutions that exist are supposed to be helpful for people. They say they're helpful for people, but we know that they're not. So if they're not listening to the people that they serve, that's why they're not helpful. So doing those things I think are, are easy things to start. Doing an assessment of what is really happening versus what we want to happen. That is a big thing. I always tell people, even just the community level, you always do a community assessment before you go somewhere and tell people what you're going to do. And if the community is not part of that and leading those efforts, then what is the point of our service? So these systems have to listen to the people that they are supposed to be helping and that they are serving. And even when we're not doing things the way we're supposed to be, we can change it. Like Philly really has a problem with saying, this is not working, let's change it. And I think we have to be better at doing that because it's okay to say, this is not working, we have to change it. And so that I think is a big start for the people in the audience that have the power to do those things. You, you mentioned funding. I thought Kendra was gonna say, fund my organization. <laughs> yeah, that too, right. fund us. Right. We are like... integrity with the money, the funding, <laughs> the, the unrestricted funding, right? Like that yeah. we can pay people and we can say, 
we want to pay this person's bill or we want to give this person a stipend without them having to verify who they are by submitting a blood sample. Like these are the <laughs> things that we need to be doing for people. Because if we're, if we're not investing in them and not believing them, like that money doesn't matter. Yeah. And I, I hope that people recognize that it's not radical anymore, right? So like think about funding new community services, um, Black-led organizations within communities that are really going to help and support families and that families will turn to and can trust for help and support and to fund people who are working to dismantle, you know, the legislation, the practices and the policies, um, fund this work to help us move forward as a, as a society. Yeah, definitely got some uh, poor nonprofit solidarity now. <laughs> oh, we're not poor, Jonah. Don't we, we reject that notion. We are not poor. <laughs> well, we could use more. Let me put it that way. <laughs> um, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, back on the sort of the riff more on kind of the low hanging fruit thing uh, um, that Kendra was just referring to. I mean, from one perspective, like when you have a system that this that's this messed up, it's like those first steps are usually kind of obvious and not that complicated, right? Um, so in our case, it's the, um, um, yeah, it's like people get deported when they don't have lawyers. Like, you know, the, there was a comprehensive study of the Universal Representation Project in New York, which has been around longer, so there's a lot more data. Um, we've only been around for two years here in Pennsylvania and we're very small compared to them. Um, but, you know, it's a, they, they, they found a thousand fold increase in your chances of winning your immigration uh, deportation case if you just had a lawyer in the courtroom with you. Um, and just in the PIFA program over two years, so represented about 100, most of them um, who have lived here 12 years or more. So people with, you know, some significant uh, connections um, to the United States. Um, and we got, you know, 44% of them released. Um, and before PIFA, you know, 4% of people without a lawyer won their cases um, in detention. Um, after PIFA, um, we got 32% of our clients um, relief. Um, so like it, it, you know, it makes a real measurable difference, you know, even if I wish I could just wave a wand and rewrite <laughs> um, the rules, um, you know, just having somebody in your corner is just such a fundamental and obvious thing to do. Um, and, um, you know, the feds aren't going to fund it, I don't think. Um, and uh, so it's it's really up to, you know, sort of um, <laughs> Harrisburg's not going to fund it right now. Um, so then it, but it's up to cities and, um, you know, and foundations to, to support that work. Most of our funding comes from the city of Philadelphia. Um, so they're, uh, you know, gave us 200 grand to to run this project. <laughs> no, Jonah needs more money. All of these <laughs> need more money. Yeah, the New York project is about, uh, or New Jersey is at $7 million a year and New York's at like, uh, oh man, $20 million a year or something. So yeah, it's, it's big numbers, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, f giving funding. And I think about even the way we spend per person, like we often track that. And with our limited resources, this past year, we've spent an average of $29,000 per kid on services. So whether that's, they need furniture in their house, they need groceries, they needed their restitution paid, they needed fines paid, all of these things cost money. So Jonah representing people who need it the most, that requires money. And so people with the power definitely give the money and not just give it, but give it to organizations where they know their model, they know how to use the money and you can still require, you know, the reporting requirements. But oftentimes I find that people try to give money with all of these restrictions that change the way the program operates. And for us, we just don't want that money because our model has shown that it works in so many ways. And if we cannot do the work that we know works, then we cannot accept certain money. So Jonah, I definitely hope that you get some more money for that. That's all. <laughs> you too, Kendra. <laughs> okay, um, before I turn it over to Anne-Marie, I, I want to acknowledge that some of what we have said um, may have felt hard to the ears of folks in the audience. Um, and I also want to acknowledge and call out that there are a lot of good people doing really great work to try to do better. And I really want to recognize those folks. I am an optimist. I am so lucky to know a lot of folks in leadership, and I believe in our potential to do much, much better. And so if you're an audience and you're in the audience and your ears are hurting, please 
just open open up your imagination a little bit that's all we're asking you to do to think a little bit differently about what is possible here because i think we can do it um i want to turn it over to Anne marie right now to get our question and answer started Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you to all of our panelists. This has been a phenomenal conversation. We have a number of questions. Um, I encourage our audience to continue submitting questions and we will get to as many as possible. The first question comes from Eliza Patton. Uh, this is directed to Kendra, but I think a number of you could, could respond. She writes, to Kendra's point that people have to see it to believe it, can you offer thoughts about the role of closed courtrooms in maintaining systems and what are the pros and cons of making proceedings in child welfare public? I think that could be for Shireen, obviously. As well. Yeah, that could be Sh Shireen too. But I mean, we're in dependency court as well, crossover court um, with both juvenile legal and dependency. But while I understand courtrooms are closed because of privacy reasons, right? Like young people need privacy. There are, these are often sensitive issues that go on. Um, I think that the public should be able to be sitting in on some of them, even if it's a limited amount of public that you have to say, oh, I wanna go here to see this. And they, they say that a limited number of people can go on, but that is really the only pro I see of a closed courtroom is respecting the sensitivity and the privacy of families in court because oftentimes it is it is stressful like it is it is a lot the cons i see are a lot of cons when it comes to closed courtrooms so i believe they should be open and i think shireen can speak better about that because she's definitely been in those courtrooms a lot more for dependency yeah this is this is a topic that like i want to dive deeper into um in terms of what it looks like and what the experiences of families are in courtrooms that are open versus those that are closed. And I often wonder just how much that experience might change and the treatment that the family is given um, in the courtroom might change if the public were there and other people were allowed to be in the courtroom. And I think um, changes in how we treat families and parents um, is a huge shift that's necessary. So. I, I'm not sure I have an opinion. I agree with Ken, Kendra that we want to respect the rights of families to have privacy to these very intimate and tough matters. Um, but at the same time, I wonder how having open courtrooms might impact the family's experiences in those courtrooms. So I'll, I'll let you know when I blog about or do a deeper dive into, into this topic. Yeah, I think that's uh yeah, that's super interesting. I think that um yeah, so immigration court proceedings are open by default. Um basically nobody who's not a lawyer or a family member shows up. Um, although in some cases, certainly, I think for exactly the same reasons, um, you know, that you know, they're 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 appropriately closed. Um, you know, if you have someone who's making a, an asylum claim based on um, you know torture or sexual violence or something, and they have to tell that whole awful story to a judge. Um, it's probably best if nobody else is around. But on the flip side, like when we were doing, um, in particular, when we were doing a high volume of bond cases at York, um, yeah, one of our tactics was to get as many people in that courtroom as we could. Um, and you know, we would actually, in a few cases, we were working with um, the participatory defense hubs out of the public defender's office um, to try to get. You know, um, you know, people from the neighborhood, um, clergy, um, just to get out there because I can't. I do think it has a, you know, it sort of shames the judge. Like, you know, why are you thinking you need to keep this person locked up for the next months and years while this thing unfolds? Um, so that 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 could be very impactful. Thank you, and thank you for mentioning the particip participatory defense hubs, Jonah. Uh, they were sort of a, a vision um, and a brainchild of our former Stonely Fellow, uh, Raj Jayadev, uh, who worked in close partnership with a number of uh, community leaders on the ground in Philadelphia. Um, our next question, uh, I think could be for, for anyone. Um, what are your thoughts on the CIT, that's the critical intervention training programs that counties and states are implementing with their police forces and first responders? Uh, Kendra, this may be for you if you're familiar. It's not enough. I mean, it's a start, right? And I think about just training in general. Does anybody remember or implement anything from one training that they've received just in their daily lives? So I think 
crisis intervention training needs to be all of the time. And um, I think about the police officers here in Philly who get CIT trained, it's not mandated. You have a choice to go through CIT training and then you, re you receive a taser. Um, and so that is not mandated for police officers in Philadelphia. I don't know if they're moving towards it, but I know that out of a police force of 6,400 officers, there were only 2,000 officers who were trained in crisis intervention about two years ago when I used to work at the Police Advisory Commission. And so we think about just how that, how your day to day, you interact with just people in general who are in crisis and that is not enough. It needs to be ongoing. So I believe it's a start for first responders, but I also don't think they should be responding to certain issues. So they should be trained, but a lot of the times they're responding to things that other professionals who are actively trained and have been trained in just beyond crisis intervention, but how to deal with people who are in crisis all the time should be responding to. Thank you, Kendra. Um, our next question comes from Carrie Krieger. Uh, do people think, uh, do, our, do our panelists think that the enactment of the Family First Act will help address the inequities of the child welfare system? Feels like a loaded question, um, but you know, I think many people recognize it as a start and that it's a good thing to open up those funds for prevention services like substance abuse treatment. Um, I think when we look at the clearinghouse, which has lists all the services that have been approved to receive those that money, it's not enough supports and services. And um, I'm also not sure that it will get at like root causes that will keep people from entering the child welfare system. Um, family first, um, was just as of October 1st, where states were supposed to submit plans. So I think there's a lot of research and tracking to be done to see what impact Family First has on keeping people out of the child welfare system. And I also want to really pay close attention to, you know, whose perspective is that coming from, right? The perspective of the system or the perspective of the community and the people who need these supports and services. I'd love to understand if they feel that, you know, the services that can be funded by Family First are covering their needs, right? We're not getting monetary supports through, through Family First or housing subsidies through, through Family First. So I think because it's so new in terms of the enactment um, that there's a lot to be seen and a lot of research and tracking to be done on the issue. Comment on that because I think what yeah. you just pulled out feels really important. Like, yeah. how do we measure success? Do we measure success by like our system metrics, or do we actually listen to families and say whether or not they feel supported? Um, and there's no metric in that for Family First. Um, and really crucially, Family First never asked families when they designed the interventions that they were going to offer. So, you know, Family First says that we can. Um, offer pr prevention services in, in three buckets. Those buckets are parenting classes, drug and alcohol treatment, and mental health treatment, and a very narrow kind of range of kind of services that folks can get within each bucket. If you talk to my parents, please talk to them. They'll tell you the number one need they have is access to safe housing, right? And so Family First ignored that need and we're gonna instead send parents to parenting classes. So like, I really worry about the design of Family First. It was designed in a way where professionals were kind of imagining what families need to stay safely together. And now the implementation is kind of replicating that and that we don't have any metrics to hear from families about whether we've met their needs. Thank you, Kathleen and Shireen. Uh, this is a question from Summit County. Uh, any suggestions suggestions on how to educate and implement anti-racist practices and policies within systems or institutions? Yes. I mean, that, that was my work when I worked within systems, right? Like I used to work at the White House. I used to work at the Department of Justice. Um, I worked for the city doing all of these things around policy changes. I used to inspect prisons and jails around policy changes that come from, you know, what people experience um, under them. And oftentimes 
I feel like an assessment is usually done and then nothing else happens beyond that. And oftentimes the assessment can be scathing, right? Like to an institution or a system and then they don't wanna do anything anymore. Just like our courts here in Philadelphia, there was a consultant that did an assessment around racism and the things that go on in our courts day to day. And after that assessment was leaked, the courts fired that consultant and we have not heard about anything since. So I think starting with an assessment from an outside perspective, an outside firm, a consultant, someone who really knows this work, but also taking it further to start implementing those things. And the assessments usually, they interview all the people who work there, they go through all the systems, they go through all the policies, they go through things that you know, we, we work with people and do. So they interview people who receive a service from them as well. But there are always recommendations that come from these assessments that institutions or systems do not wanna do. And so starting there and starting with the fact that these are gonna be things that are not gonna change overnight, right? They're not gonna change in five minutes, but if we're not swallowing and processing what these recommendations are and figuring out how we can implement those recommendations, then there's really no point in that. But everybody has to be on the same page. If leadership is not willing to implement those changes, it's not gonna happen. So I would say trying to get leadership on board, not, not those who you know don't make any decisions because they're usually the ones on board. And so we have to get everybody on the same page and that change has to be wanted to happen. Gotcha. Yeah, one, one, one quick thing I, I, I think on this is, well, this is sort of more of kind of a bigger picture comment that I was thinking about the other day because um, so NSC turns 100 this year. So we were founded, you know, during, you know, the huge, there was a huge surge in immigration to the US, you know, through 1900 through 19, in 1920. And they're all people coming from, you know, largely it was Eastern Europe and Italy and Ireland. Um, and there was an enormous backlash. And, um, you know, these strict quota systems were put in place. And that's where some of the early uh, grounds of uh, excluding people because of criminal conduct came from, um, and sort of excluding people of like poor moral character and all this. Um, and, you know, largely this was a way to, you know, sort of uh, bar either people who were different, so Catholics and Jews at the time was the big concern, um, or people who were poor. Um, but the history since then was that, you know, those Italian and Irish immigrants and their children and their grandchildren were sort of allowed to join, you know, sort of the collective prosperity of America and went from being sort of others to just, you know, white people in America. Um, current groups of immigrants are coming in large numbers, not from Europe, obviously. Um, and they're also working in Amazon warehouses and as Uber drivers and in sort of like the lower rungs of our service sector. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a there's there's a question like, is there going to be a path for people um, to, um, you know, really access economic prosperity in the same way because they're not white people? Um, and I think that that's um, really a, an open question, um, just in terms of kind of economic justice uh, in this country generally. I was going to add to to this discussion about you know anti-racist policies and in, in systems. Um, there really needs to be an evaluation of the culture um, within within systems, and with that is looking at the perspective in which you approach families, right? And people who are minorities or poor people, right? And if you're not approaching this from the perspective of like, parents deserve to be with their children, children deserve to be with their parents um, and having respect for people of color or uh, people who are poor, then, you're already, you know, at a at a disadvantage in functioning from, you know, a racist um, perspective. So I really think drilling into the culture and the perspective at which you approach the families that your system serve is so critical to moving forward to um, anti-racist work. Thank you all um, so much for those answers. 
Our next question comes from Catherine Dolan. It's directed to all panelists. Are there strategies you have found successful in closing the gap between agencies making the day-to-day -day impact and policymakers who are often disconnected from their constituents? So strategies in closing that gap between sort of agencies and institutions, um, or, or I would add maybe even community organizers and then the policymakers. So for EF Philly, um, we are very embedded in policy and organizing. And so I think people get confused because they're like, wait, don't you work with young people every day? But for us, it's you should be a part of both. If your direct work impacts policy, you should have like we're building a policy team you should be doing the direct work and working simultaneously on policy and also running for office there's a disconnect because we elect people who don't know anything about what is happening and they're making legislation so running for office for people who you would say oh they're not a politician we don't want politicians we should have regular people doing the work elected into these offices and being surrounded by people who have the political background so i think for us that's that's some strategy that people can implement is being connected to the policy work being involved in it but also running for elected office Yeah, fill, fill that disconnect and that gap by having people with lived expertise at the table to make those policy changes and those decisions. Um, I've been planning a number of congressional briefings and we've had lots of discussions about how, how important it is to have parents and young people who have experienced the system be a part of those discussions, right? Like don't consult after the fact, invite them to the table well before the strategizing starts or the agenda is built. Um, and you know, with that, I think you would have far less of a, of a disconnect of what's actually happening to people. Great, thank you. Um, this question comes from Alexander Schneider. Uh, he asks if um, there are some great examples of the investments in communities and families uh, that you have that's, that's happening and that's working uh, and that's being measured and documented. So I think this could be really for anyone. I can give one example that's sort of very timely um, in that, uh, so when the pandemic hit and, you know, people were getting stimulus checks, obviously those were not going to, you know, most of our clients because, um, you know, many of them were undocumented and, you know, ineligible. Um, and so, you know, we raised a bunch of money and just were um, cutting people checks. I mean, which was something we'd never really done before, but it was awesome, <laughs> um, you know, just to be able to, well, I guess technically there were, there were like Visa gift cards, um, but, you know, just helping people kind of make that next rent payment um, or, I mean, we also like really ramped up our food distribution um, kind of part of our operation that used to just be tied to a refugee resettlement um, part of the agency, um, but we really opening it up for everybody. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's, um, which, which again, I think is kind of like something that wouldn't have necessarily uh, occurred to us. It's kind of like ours is the immigration space, not the, you know, we don't, not really a, a food pantry organization or a direct kind of a cash assistance type organization. Um, so I think it was kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of a silver lining in that it sort of said, you know, oh, we, we can do these things and we can make a, make a real impact in people's lives by doing it. Yeah, I mean, there's so much research that shows when we just give people money, right, their circumstances are better. So like even the mayor of, where was he at? Stockton, California. They ended up giving families $500 a month payments, no strings attached. And they, they recorded, evaluated those outcomes and those families are doing better. And I think oftentimes, there's a narrative that goes with, oh, we can't give people money because they'll go buy drugs with it or they'll go spend it on things that they don't need when there's research that supports that that's also not true. So investing in the community, I think about Yeah Philly where our neighborhood, when they first found out that we were trying to buy this space, some of our neighbors didn't want us there. They said, oh, you, you help criminals. You know, people die here all the time. We don't, we don't wanna add 
you know, extra violence to our block. Since Yefili has been on that block, there has been no one shot on that block. There has been no one killed on that block. So investment is very real when you're helping the community you're in have access to things that they need, things change. So I would definitely look up the things that support that research. There's so much out there that if we just help people and reduce the barriers and things that they need, it's just better for them. We, we have our eye on um, <clears throat> these pre-petition advocacy programs that are popping up in different places. And, um, you know, I think some of them are not funded by the Child Welfare Agency and have a separate source of funds. Um, I like those a little bit better, although um, I think the work of all of them are probably super important in helping steer families out of <clears throat> the child welfare system and helping them get, you know, legal assistance or help with housing or um, evictions or um, other sort of like legal help before there is um, a petition or involvement with the system. And so <clears throat> I know new ones are popping up and um, there remains to be seen sort of what the research looks like in steering people away from the systems as a result of having this pre-petition help. Um, we have a question I think would be applicable to all three of you. Um, to define who currently has access to family courtrooms uh, and is there more that those who are already in the room could be doing? I could tell you the state of the law on that because I've actually researched this because I'm very interested in the subject and then maybe I love the second part that I actually don't know the answer to what other folks who are already in the rooms could be doing. So we have a we are um, we have a very schizophrenic law state of the law in Pennsylvania. So there is a constitutional presumption for openness for all court proceedings in the Commonwealth, and yet we have a statute that presumes that child welfare courts are closed, right? And so. My, my personal take on that is we have an unconstitutional statute <laughs> um, because, because there's nothing in the statute that actually recognizes, honors the presumption or, or gives uh, direction to families about how they, if they want to invite the media to their courtroom, they could. There is one published case from the Superior Court suggesting that families or that media could apply to the court to um, ask for permission on individual cases to come watch a proceeding. My personal take on that is that is not a presumption of openness. A presumption of openness means you start with openness and the barrier should be in front of anybody who wants to close the court. So we have a very schizophrenic state of the law. So if there are any lawyers out there that wanna like take this up and try to get it resolved, mazel tov and I'll, I'll, I'll happy to talk more, but I, I it, as, at knowing that this is where we are right now, I'd love to hear what other folks think about what we can do. Kendra or Shireen or Jonah, did you want to add to that? Oh. I mean, I can add in terms of that second part of the question about people who are in the courtroom now. I mean, I, as somebody who worked in, in child welfare and independency court, I know how easy it is to sort of get in this mode of like rubber stamping and like checking the box. And I think people really need to go back to what the standards are, what the law is, and really challenge when standards aren't being met, right? Like, did the agency actually make reasonable efforts to keep that child at home? Did they actually make reasonable efforts to reunify families? Like really challenge um, what's being done and whether the actions actually do rise to what the law calls for. And I think um, utilizing some of the research that is now out there about the trauma of separation for children and families and, and what that looks like. There's so much research and if people just introduce it in their cases, um, maybe it will start to shift, shift thinking and opinions. Yeah, I love that. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm a social worker. So stick stick with Kathleen for for the statute. I don't I don't know. But um, I think for us, it's it's about educating the people who are in the system, right? Like we teach a lot of young people their rights. 
and especially within DHS and DHS doesn't like that. Like Kua does not like me because they're like, did you tell this person to tell me this around? No, but guess what? She knows she's been in the system for 10 years and she's now being empowered because she knows her rights. She's just never been able to speak up about them. So teaching and educating and empowering people to start learning what their rights are, right? Like, no, you cannot leave me out of my foster home until midnight because you don't want me in the house and you lock me out. And I know that I can call this person if something like this happens. So definitely the education is big because once more people start to be educated about what is supposed to be happening versus what is happening, that's when shifts even on a smaller scale start to happen. And I just sort of, uh, I think, reiterate what I kind of mentioned before is I do think that, you know, as long as it's appropriate, there can be power in, um, you know, shaming these systems and by bearing witness to what they're doing. Um, and sometimes that's just, you know, more bodies in a courtroom where some injustice is going down, um, you know, and it doesn't always work. And like, sometimes it can feel kind of like, a you know, a, a, a feeble response, but in some cases, it's kind of all we got. Um, so yeah, whether that's, you know, supporting people through bond proceedings, um, the new sanctuary movement was working a lot on that, um, you know, in the last couple of years, um, it's sort of a, you know, a church based uh, organization in terms of just like getting people to show up and support people who are in these situations. Um, and I will say like, you know, at least make the, these judges slow down and try to see the person in front of them as a, as a human being. I mean, sometimes I read Kate, you know, I read transcripts from like proceedings where, you know, someone is pro se, doesn't have a lawyer with them. So it's that situation where it's just them, the judge and the prosecutor in the courtroom. And oh man, like, it's just the most preemptory, like, I see you have an arrest. You have no options. You have no relief. All you, you're only right. This is a direct quote from a transcript. And this is also an utter misstatement of the law. Your only right is to choose what country I'm about to deport you to. That's it. <laughs> Not true. Um, but, um, you know, that's, you know, but if, you know, you get some other people in the courtroom, and if, even if they're not lawyers, I think that can sort of bend that sort of scenario a little bit. Well, thank you. I think that's a powerful note to end on, uh, this idea of bringing more light and transparency and education and humanity uh, to, to each of the systems in which each of you work. Um, on behalf of Stonely staff and board of directors, I'd just like to thank each of you today. Just what a fantastic lineup of panelists, Jonah, Kendra, and Shireen, for sharing your expertise and candor and really powerful reimaginings of our public systems. I think you've given us not only important food for thought, but also clear calls to action for how to more holistically meet the needs of Philadelphia's youth and families. And of course, I'd really like to thank Kathleen for your stellar uh, and enthusiastic moderation of today's discussion. We're so honored to count you among our Stonely Fellow alumni, and we're grateful for all of your work on behalf of families throughout the city and state and really across the country. Um, I'd like to mention that today's webinar was the first in a series of events focused on reimagining public systems. If you haven't already registered, we encourage you to join us on Tuesday, December 7th for a virtual convening focused on reimagining our housing, education, and behavioral health care systems. Finally, in concert with this event series, we are currently seeking letters of inquiry for fellowship projects one to three years in duration that offer a broad reimagining of how our public systems might better serve youth, families, and communities. Really precisely the kinds of ideas and visions that you heard today. Um, letters are due by December the 15th. Please visit our website, stonelyfoundation.org slash reimagining to learn more. With that, I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for tuning in for your excellent questions and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you.